Hello again to those who attended the uh, earlier session about uh, partition. I see that everybody now is looking more constitutional uh, and is ready for a slight sort of change in tone. So I'll, I'll hope that I'm not too sort of uh, wound up when speaking now. Um, uh, so we're talking about constitutions in the plural, and I guess we're talking about we the peoples. Um, and we're going to try and cover, I think, quite a lot of uh, ground. Um, I guess the, the, the starting point uh, for today's conversation or debate comes out of the exhibition, the incredible exhibition that was on at the British Library last year about Magna Carta, uh, out of which was generated a discussion on the influence of the Magna Carta at the Jayapal Literature Festival in January of this year. Um, Helena Kennedy and Chintan Chandrachud were both on that panel, and it was really uh, interesting, the sort of connections and disconnections between earlier versions of English law and uh, the creation of the Indian Constitution and how that plays out today in 2017. Um, Helena Kennedy, can I ask you just to start off with... Um, is, this is a bit of a stretch, but with, with your, very much with your lawyer's hat on. Um, how does Magna Carta feed into what becomes the law under which we operate in the United Kingdom today? Uh, and why is it constitutionally seen as so important? Well, a whole mythology has developed around Magna Carta. Um, and we, we claim it as being the sort of the beginning of, uh, of all rights in Britain. Um, and, and it certainly was very significant because it was... It was can, I, can I just stop and do a technical thing? I, you might have to turn your microphone... Uh, I'm up there. I dare not do it, but you yeah, might need to... No, the, the one that's on, on the your... The one that's on your... Uh, yeah, it's, you need it's to it's clip it the other way. Yeah, yeah that's much that better. Yeah. Yeah. This, is my, this is my Jaipur dress, I want okay. you to know. I bought <laughs> it in January. <laughs> I, I thought I would give it an outing for all of you. <laughs> Um, so let me let me get this fixed. That's perfect. Are we That's on? Perfect. Is that fine? Can you hear me? Can yeah. anybody hear me? Yeah, oh, great. Um, I was just saying that. I mean, Magna Carta for us, for, for British people, um, you know, we, we lay claim to it. And I, I say British because the Scots are more ambivalent about Magna Carta, and we claim uh, um, the Declaration of Our Broth as being our, dec uh, our Magna Carta. But it's that, that thing that says nobody is above the law. And so it really, we claim it as being the beginning of the rule of law because it was saying to the king, you can't get away with this. You too are, are, are having to respond to and, and, and uh, uh, abide by law. And, and it was also saying to the king, you can't go around shoving everybody around, overtaxing them, making them take part in foreign wars, familiar. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, there should be some constraint on the power of the king. And so that has fed into all of those developments since, where um, what we know is that rights have never been given away. They're almost always, I mean, I mean, I mean they're always, I would say, has to be a struggle to secure rights for people, whether it's women, whether it's working class people, whether it's uh, uh, homosexual, whoever it is, they all, there's always a struggle beforehand. Power is never readily given away. Um, and we see that, the Magna Carta, as being very, very much as a sort of totem of saying this is what this is where rights in a way started and where people started making a claim on those with power that they have to actually uh, cede to the power of others and and so it, it has that significance we've sort of wrapped it in a mythology um, that gives it more I mean if you look at Magna Carta and read it again it says nothing really about women and it says nothing about poor folks and serfs and the lower orders and so it really doesn't give an awful lot away it's mainly about property rights and the property rights of the the landed aristocracy so it's it was a fairly limited document in many ways but it actually it's the power of it that actually matters. Thanks so much. Um, Shrapan, if I can ask you, uh, I think with your historian's hat on uh, for the moment, uh, the political one can possibly be popped on and off as we, as we speak, but um, why was it that in the 1940s, certainly British officialdom saw the constituent assembly and the writing of the constitution as being something that was peripheral and not particularly important, and yet somehow the constitution now has this role in the Indian public conversation where people always refer to it in order to make a kind of larger moral point? Well, firstly, I disagree with you that it, uh, the British officials never saw it as very important. The entire 1930s, if you really look at it, was uh, even domestic British politics to a very large extent was influenced by a consideration of the India Bill. Right. Uh, 
there were two is issues involved. One, one is the question of the quantum of self-government, which you're going to give to India. And secondly, what is the nature? How do you do define federation? And this was very much part of it. And that was the baggage which India inherited yeah. to a very large extent. And the 1935 India Act, which was passed by the British Parliament, mm -hmm. became the working template for the Indian Constitution of 1947 to, to, therefore to say that in 1947, India made a completely fresh start right. on a blank slate, I think, while uh, politically tempting, is not historically completely accurate. Okay, so let me just define my terms a little. It's true, of course, that the 1935 Government of India Act was the result of uh, lots of kind of tormented debate in the British Parliament. It, it, it led to almost the collapse of Winston Churchill's career, which, of course, then in, in 1940 <coughs> rather, rather shifted gear. But I, I guess what I'm saying is that in the, um, the debates or conversations around independence and how it was going to work, whether partition or not was going to happen, uh, the leadership of the Congress in particular said, let's devote time to figuring out what the Indian Constitution is going to be. Uh, and that, that was seen by uh, British officialdom at that time as being secondary. But uh, what, what I'd really like you to touch on is why now, or what, why really arguably for the last half century, have people in India focused so much on what the Constitution allows you or doesn't allow you to do? Well, I think there have been uh, two schools of thought in India, and it really uh, boils down to the question of how do we define our nationhood. Uh, there is a school of thought which believes in what can loosely be called, and I'm taking after the German uh, experience, uh, what is called constitutional patriotism. Mm. And against that, which you have another notion of India that, yes, while the constitution is a working document which sets the rules on which political activity is governed, the nationhood is something which is far more cultural. And it's really these, it's, it's a conflict between these two schools of thought. And part of it has been complicated when uh, in the mid 70s, the constitution tried to codify certain <laughs> concepts which had not been there. And I, I mean, uh, the, um, among the, uh, I think directive, um, the, um, among, in, in the preamble to the constitution, which in 1947 set out India as a democratic republic where sovereignty vested with the people. In the, in the mid-1970s, two crucial words were added. One was the term socialism, which becomes a bit meaningless in today's context. Okay, we, we, and we second like one was the moment. term secularism, which has become, that codification has become the source of a lot of problems. Okay, so before we get on to the amendments to the Constitution, Jinder, can I come, come back to you again as a lawyer? Yeah. Um, why, the, why the centrality of, of co the Constitution in Indian public life? Why have people taken it up and adopted it to make their arguments? Sure, I think there are, there are several reasons for which the Constitution has captured the public imagination. Uh, part of them, uh, one of the major reasons is the fact that the Constitution is now the barometer for moral argument in India. Uh, so everything that is unconstitutional is wrong. And everything that is wrong is treated as unconstitutional. Uh, now you might well say that, that that's not always a good thing because the court does tend to uphold things which are not, not always great. Uh, but this is the way that it's perceived in the popular imagination. Part of it is also historical. I mean, if you think of the 1970s, the emergency, um, and the fact that many people look upon the fact that the Supreme Court has in a way rescued the state, yeah. the, the development of public interest litigation, the fact that the court, that legislatures and the executive have ceded power to the Supreme Court, uh, have also lent to this idea that it's ultimately the constitution rather than one of its components that is supreme. Um, so I don't think we can disconnect this idea of constitutional supremacy with this movement or this shift in political power from the legislature on the one hand and the courts on the other. Right. Um, so to, uh, this, this notion of constitutional supremacy, I would suggest, is closely linked to the idea of juristocracy itself, wow. where essentially the court is playing sort of a multifaceted role going beyond its traditional domain. Yeah. Well, that's a, a great coinage. 
Is that your, your term, juristocracy? Well, I've read it in much of the literature. It's very good. I, 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 I don't it, think you, I you heard it here first. <laughs> I, I, I've, never, I've never heard it before. I, and please don't tell it to the Brexiteers, because, uh, um, because, because they, they're always accusing judges of, uh, of, of being too powerful. Um, I, I, uh, I mean, the thing about constitutions, and I, and I say this as somebody who used to chair something called Charter 88. And, and I, from 1989, all the way through until Labour in 19, uh, came into government in 1997 and had a whole kind of raft of constitutional reforms, which we persuaded them to take on. Um, um, through that whole period, we were arguing for a written constitution. And one of the reasons why was I think that um, we'd looked around the world and we'd felt that this business of our not having a written constitution left us with a lot of, uh, of lacunae where people didn't know exactly where, 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 where did people's rights come from and what, what, were the, the, what was the basis of them? So there was a problem around that. And so I've always felt rather drawn towards the idea of a constitution as a nation-building thing and as a thing which could be a unifier. However, mm. I have to say that watching what's happening just now in Trump's America, <laughs> uh, um, where I had spent some time, you see, as a young lawyer in, in, uh, um, when I was in my 20s in the United States, and I thought I'd watched great lawyers using the Constitution in positive ways. And by God, is America going to need constitutional lawyers now? Because Trump is, is, is absolutely uh, tramping all over the, the, the Constitution. And you really have to think about how, if unless it really is something that, that is respected, it actually can become somewhat degraded in what it's, what it's offering. I mean, the idea that, that he can, for example, not separate his business interests um, from the, uh, the role of president. Mm -hmm. The idea that he can, through nepotism, bring so many people into government and, and appoint them. Those things that we would consider to be absolutely, I, I really don't think they could happen here, and we don't have a written constitution, but I think that the norms that have been created around politics actually would say that that, that couldn't be done. But and he seems to be trampling all over things that had attached themselves to, the, you know, the, 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 the president is not supposed to gain any emoluments or any benefits from his role as president. Well, my God, it doesn't look quite like that now. Right. And, uh, and so the, 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 I, I think constitutions, as, as people have said, is, you know, you, they really are, we breathe life into them. And we are the people who keep them alive. And we are the people who at times will, will, will allow for our judiciary to kind of, if you like, advance what they're saying and interpret them but, in, but, in, I mean, in is, contemporary ways. Is the difficulty ways. there with the, with the US Constitution really around the fact the, the lack of specificity on the role of the president and to, the, to what extent he can act outside it, and that almost like the rest of it still functions fine? Well, I mean, th th there's no doubt that there, 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 are, there are very profoundly wonderful things about the American Constitution. I mean, I, I, I would agree with that. But the problem is that those things which are about custom and practice and the sort of additional things about uh, convention um, are, are so soft, and particularly around the role of president, that, that, that he's being able to run roughshod around them. So I, you know, I think the constitutions, we should recognize that they have their limitations in trying to, to, to uh, really hold people to account. What they do do, though, is that they can be inspirational. They can actually make us think better about who we are as a people. And I think that's one of the things that, pe that, 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 that people seek from a constitution. Shafan, would, would, you, would you argue from a traditionalist point of view that the unwritten constitution should be defended for its flexibility? Or do you think a written constitution is, in most circumstances, the best answer for a nation? Well, you see, I mean, I can't really speak very much about an unwritten constitution because in India we've always uh, operated. Uh, thing. I mean, Br Britons were perfectly well in a democratic way for a very long time with an unwritten constitution, whether it should have it or not. But I think there is a larger issue, which is really a, 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 of some concern, I find of some concern, is using a constitutional straitjacket as a substitute for political decisions. You know, that you always limit the scope of political decision making with a certain constitutional framework and say, therefore, this cannot be done. That, whether that goes against the basic sovereignty of the people. And are you referring to a specific debate? Well, I'm referring to certain uh, instances, for instance, in India. I'm not going into it because I'm, I'm not that familiar with the uh, intricacies of the Trump administration. But in India, we've had a very interesting case about who chooses the judges. And that was, therefore, when Parliament, both houses of Parliament, almost unanimously, passed a certain, laid down a certain procedure of how to reform the judicial selection process, mm -hmm. 
the judges overturned it on the grounds. And one of the most interesting ways in which they overturned it, when they say, was that uh, uh, consent and concurrence, consultation and concurrence mean the same thing. <coughs> Now, that was, to my mind, a linguistic slate of hand done for very self-serving reasons. Judges are very good at that. Very good at that. <laughs> in, in fact, the question of judicial overreach in India has reached such a point that today we have the most bizarre situation of the judges presiding over the administration of cricket. <laughs> I mean, to my mind, that seems, I think that epitomizes the absurdity of you know, ju judicial but doesn't, overreach. But doesn't that, doesn't that happen? when there is loss of confidence in politicians, and therefore the one bit of our constitutional arrangements that people do seem to have trust in is the senior judiciary. Certainly in Britain, what's happened increasingly is that you know, whenever something goes badly wrong, you set up an inquiry, you put a senior judge at the head of it. Whenever anything uh, is, 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 is sort of fraught, it's to the judiciary that people seek to turn. I mean, we too in Britain have seen the development of um, public interest litigation, of the whole business of judicial review, and of going to the judiciary because of a, a sort of growing sense of that, that, that politicians get it wrong and that politicians can't be trusted to put it right. And so we've, we have played a part in giving judges this incredible power. Can, can I just, just yeah. a, a Chintan, I mean, from, from a purely yeah. disinterested point of view, do you want sure. to defend the position of judges? Sure. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, fairly, defend them. <laughs> I'm fairly critical of judges myself. But what I would say is that we shouldn't fall into the trap of treating judicial overreach as this large meta category. And, and the better thing or the more nuanced position to take is to try and examine the cases, well, decision by decision, and see exactly what's happening. Now, once you deconstruct, for example, what the Supreme Court is doing, you notice that there's a, there are wide divergences between what the court does in some cases as opposed to others. The first question you'd ask is, is the court genuinely engaging in robust rights reasoning? Is it providing, is it adjudicating, in other words, rather than voting? Uh, and what we've seen increasingly in the uh, caseload of the Indian Supreme Court is that the court makes significant decisions without offering any reasons for them at all. Um, the classic example of this being where the court mandated the playing of the national anthem before all movie theaters in a two-page interim order, um, a, a decision of that significance made without reasons. The second factor that I'd look at is to what extent is the court engaging in a form of reasoning that is incrementalist, that is genuinely enforceable, as opposed to hopelessly aspirational? And we have seen the court do this from time to time. In the right to food case, the court very gradually and very incrementally builds upon its case law and jurisprudence in a way that can be enforced, uh, whereas in other cases it essentially goes haywire to the extent that you have you know, the law of the land, you have the judgment on the one side, and you have political reality on the other. I, I, so I, if, you, I, if you'd both like to respond to that point, but can, can you, when you do it, I um, mean, you, you both have the, the inside view from the respective upper house of parliament. Uh, ha has that experience of being in the upper house made you have more faith in how the constitution, unwritten or otherwise, operates? I think, I think a, 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 a useful thing to, to look at is that, um, is that what happens when you have populism, and I think that we've seen that in, in both, both of our countries, mm. um, uh, the rise of, of, of populist government. Yeah. And what happens is that you often see attacks on the judiciary. And, that, and, and by this, I, I, I'm not suggesting that the judges always get it right, but you start seeing attacks on institutions like the judiciary, which should be alarmist and should, and should cause us alarm. And what happened here um, quite recently was that after the Brexit, after the referendum uh, vote, there was, a, there was a discussion about, should, it, should Parliament, having had that vote, does it, is it for Theresa May as the, as the Prime Minister, because Cameron has stepped down, was it for Theresa May to decide when to, to trigger um, uh, Article 50, or was it that things had to come back to Parliament, that we're a parliamentary de representative of democracy, and although we've taken the, uh, the account of the public in a referendum, that still it goes back to Parliament, and that Parliament had to be the place that triggered it, not some you know, little uh, uh, cabinet meeting in, in private triggering it. 
And that challenge was, was taken through the courts. I think it should have actually been dealt with in Parliament. Parliament should have taken the thing of saying, we, Parliament, should be deciding this. But it went through the courts, and our newspapers described our, our judiciary, our chief justice, and the senior judges who made the decision that, that, in fact, Parliament should decide this. It was a legal decision, a constitutional decision, and they were described as being enemies of the people. And once you get that populist attack on the judiciary to undermine them, then I think that you, you're, you're in danger of, of undermining the rule of law. And which, interestingly, in India would not have been legally possible. You, you couldn't have had that headline. Well, you couldn't have had that headline in, in Well, India? you couldn't have had the headlines because the judges are rather, you know, touchy about what their, <laughs> constitutes their <laughs> dignity. And, um, you know, there's a thing called the contempt of court, which is cited a bit too frequently and a bit too liberally. Uh, but there, there's a larger question. I, I, I do understand. I mean, there, there is this very gray area about what constitutes the sovereignty of the people. Mm -hmm. Whether the referendum outcome constitutes the, constituted the final word, or whether there had to be a nominal reference to Parliament to actually get it, to, which is more a procedural issue. Well, it was an issue, because Parliament was hardly going to fly in the face of, ex it, ex of ex the people's except, vote. Except that a lot of them didn't really see it as a procedural issue, that it was often used as a way of a corrective. That parliament would become the corrective to popular aspirations. And I think when we talk about populism, yes, I think we all in our private <laughs> capacities do have certain misgivings over populism. But ultimately, you know, one of the great uh, occupational hazards of a democracy is that ultimately we have to bow down. It's to the will of the but people. Do, do, I mean, do you both have a higher regard for Parliament since being in Parliament, or does it go the other way? I, I certainly do. You know, okay. <coughs> seeing it from the outside, you often had this rather simplistic and over-caricatured view of the politicians being a bunch of goons, if not a bunch of jokers. <laughs> uh, whereas when you go inside, you realize that while there may be the odd individuals who certainly fit into that category. No, let, let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> I think there are a lot of people who have a certain weight of experience. Mm. And that experience is quite valuable of what they can and cannot do. And that experience is invaluable in terms of getting legislation. And this I've found far more in the parliamentary sessions. It's in the committee meetings, where people actually talk far more frankly mm. and candidly and uh, without necessarily attaching themselves to predetermined party line. So it's been a useful experience. I, 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 I would agree with Bhavan. Going into the House of Lords, I have to honestly admit to all of you, I, I was absolutely in favour of a democratically elected second chamber. I've, I've come to have a much more mixed view on it, and partly because I've seen the ways in which um, um, it's been possible for the House of Lords to bring in constituencies or representatives of constituencies who never get elected. Um, and so we've got, in fact, much more diversity in the, in, the, in, the, in the upper chamber than you actually get in the House of Commons, believe it or not. Uh, and higher percentage of women now and uh, people from um, and minorities of, of many different kinds. And, it's, and so th that's been an enrichment. But the other thing that happens is, is you're absolutely right, that on committees, I um, sat on the, the, the Joint Committee on Human Rights, which is a, 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 an upper and lower chamber committee. And it was, um, it was wonderful because you've got every, people from across the parties and you really can hone in on where legislation is going to fail to protect uh, human rights. I've, I now have been sitting on the, the European uh, Union Select Committee in the House of Lords and I chair the justice part of that. And by God, did nobody know how much law was going to be affected by the referendum. I mean, it's going to take us 10 years to kind of sort it all out. Nobody had a clue that it was about consumer rights, it was about trading rights. That if, if, you're, if, you know, if you trade with Poland and they don't pay, the company there doesn't pay you for the widgets you've sold them, you can get an order in the courts here and it can be made effective in the courts there within, within a very short period of time. People had no idea about any of that. Stuff to do with family law, stuff to do with uh, you know, environmental rights, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that th those committees are the, the great riches that, are, that I've seen inside Parliament and the ways in which people reach b beyond party political, you know, the party, mm. tribal party political positions. I just want to come back on this, um, on this discourse on popular sovereignty and what tends to worry me about it is and particularly in the context of Brexit is, why is it that we empower a 50 plus 1% effectively majority 
to make changes of an irreversible character. Um, there's something about that process that seems wrong. Uh, to start with, I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't necessarily think that a referendum is the best way of capturing the public, the, the, the public sentiment. Uh, because, of course, it's frozen in time. It, on a specific day, it's one vote. Why is it that we don't conduct a referendum over a longer period of time? Why is it that we don't conduct multiple referenda? Remember, for instance, that our own constitution, which you might well suggest is one of the most democratically legitimate and widely accepted constitutions worldwide, was not in fact submitted to a referendum and was framed essentially by a, by a committee. Um, and one of the merits of entrenching a constitution is precisely this. Uh, the fact that significant changes cannot be made um, bli you know, blithely, easily, um, in the course of a, of a debate over a day. Um, these changes need to be carefully thought through. The second point is that a, an entrenched constitution tends to introduce a culture of rights discourse. And the best example of this you have in the UK is the enactment of the Human Rights Act. Uh, the Human Rights Act has been around for probably, well, for not more than 20 years. Uh, 1998, 1998 so into effect in 2000. 2000 so, yes, yeah. so about 17 years. Um, and it's introduced a remarkable rights language into parliament, yeah. uh, which simply did not exist before. Um, so I think we do seriously need to think about this idea of entrenchment. My only concern is this. I mean, it, it's, it's a problem of infinite regress in a way, which is that how do we enact a constitution here? Uh, I mean, if we do submit it to a referendum, you essentially have a package of reforms with some, some amendments which don't have majority support and some which do. And there are all sorts of problems with the process. But I think those problems can probably be, um, I mean, the, be resolved. The, the, the truth is, Patrick, is that, is that it would be very difficult in Britain uh, for any, any government to seek to create a written constitution because it would take up the time of Parliament and for, you know, until the cows came home. You know, it would go on forever um, with all the small print and so on. And I just don't see any political party coming into government doing that when they've got so many other things that they're going to have to deal with. So it's, I, don't think, I don't see it happening. What happens is you get tweaking around the edges. And one of those things that is, I think really people now share concern about is that we've, the, the use of referenda, referenda has meant, uh, has, you know, has really become something that's alarmed senior judges and, and many others because of precisely the thing you're talking about. The idea that on, on such a small margin, something that's going to affect hugely uh, and have great consequences for the people of Britain. I happen to, I was, I was against uh, um, uh, leaving Europe and I actually think it's going to make people poorer. Ordinary folk in this country are going to be poorer as a result. Um, but, but it's the question, that's that constitutional question, which is, why wasn't it that it was 60% that you'd have to have? Or you have to have a certain turnout in, in, to, of people voting and so on. And the problem was that only the year before, we'd had a referendum in Scotland yeah. when none of that had been done either. So right. that we were kind of tied into a way of having referenda. But the one but bit that was left out was the young. In Scotland, in the Scottish referendum, p young people that from, you know, from 16 upwards could vote because it had such an importance for them into the future. And that was argued for by Alex Salmond and uh, David uh, Cameron succumbed to it. And, but they didn't do that with the, the, the Brexit vote. Mm -hmm. And yet, if they had done, I think that the young were so much in favor of internationalism, of connection with the world, of their op own opportunities being limited by, by leaving, that you might have had, actually had a different and, and also, I mean, just, just, uh, just, just, just one, one second. I, also, I mean, you know, if you look at the, the decolonization process and the kind of advice that was coming out of London to countries that were decolonizing, if there was to be a referendum under a new constitution in a given country that was becoming independent, almost always there was a qualification of saying that you needed more than a certain percentage of the people voting for it. But I, I just want to move a little more theoretically. Um, group rights, individual rights, fairness, the uh, famous thought experiment of John Rawls, the idea that if you want to dream up a perfect way for a society to operate, you have to imagine that you're blind to your own position within it. So in other words, if you say, well, slavery is a good way to have like 30% of the group community in a country can be slaves, everybody else can be whatever, you have to not know whether you're going to be the king or the slave. Um, theoretically, if you had the opportunity to make significant alterations to the constitution of your country, what do you think needs to be changed? What do you think is not working and needs to be altered? Swapin first. 
That's a very difficult one because, you know, the, the Indian constitution is remarkably flexible. In 70 years, I think we've got, uh, we are at present debating the 132nd Amendment to the Constitution. So it's, it's, it's a remarkably flexible document which <coughs> continuously changes. And I think I'm very glad that it's been there. Uh, but would you like to reverse those changes of the 1970s that you alluded to earlier? You know, uh, I'm, I'm a little uncommon. I'll go back to that, some mm. of the argument about the referendum. And I think one of the, mis what, what I find a little, little disturbing about the various objections to the entire referendum process, which is going on, which, which has been positive, uh, is that it's a constant attempt to shift the goalposts. You decided on a set of norms on which a decision was going to be made. The Britain's, the UK's entry into the then EEC at that point was also decided ultimately or ratified by a, a, a referendum because a decision suits you you don't question it. If the decision doesn't suit you, all sorts of questions that are coming. So, I, I mean, we have a very set process of how a constitution can be amended. I believe in the past there's been a lot of attempts to put in a bit too many entitlements, mm -hmm. which are time specific and make those into constitutional norms which to my mind, and it also reeks of impractic impracticality. And the, the, there's, a, there's a sort of attempt which is constantly being made to ensure that something is permanent by making it a part of the Constitution. So would you like the word socialist and secular to be removed? I would. I personally would. Certainly socialist. Uh, but secular you could live with. Um, I think the problem with the word secular is not that it was the constitution of India wasn't secular in the in, past. In its origin. In its origin, right. because it always had equality of religion, it right. always had uh, ensured no discrimination, etc. But when you put in secular, you also try and codify it. And then you have these endless and sometimes meaningless debate about what is the Indian secularism, mm -hmm. how is it different from the French secularism, mm -hmm. and how is it different from some other secularism. And we get into this entire completely meaningless debate. And to my mind, from the mid-70s to about now, I think a lot of time and energy has been expended on actually trying to do, define what exactly is secularism, when we all know that basically it means you just sort of live and let live is the issue. Right. Kinton. Well, I'm, somehow I'm not as concerned about whether those words are, should or should not be in the Constitution. I mean, in, in my view, bringing those words in the, into the preamble was a mistake in itself, uh, because the preamble is, a, is essentially a historical document, um, and it seems odd to try and amend a historical document. Uh -huh. But even that being the case, if you were to remove but sorry, can, these can I just words, ask you, would, yes. you, would you agree with the, the point that actually the Constitution as conceived in 1950 was secular? Well, it, it was secular, so, yes. So it didn't need to be added? It, it didn't need to be added. Right, okay. And at the same time, if we remove it now, that's not going to fundamentally change the character of our polity. Okay. Um, our Constitution is defined not by a single word in the preamble, but by what permeates its text. Yeah. And by removing one word, you're not changing the character sure. of the Constitution. It would be hard to imagine a constitution in Britain that had the word socialism in it. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine You that. wait till but Jeremy I, Corbyn yeah, is, is I, triumphant I, on June the 8th. I, 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 I just can't imagine that. Even, even Jeremy Corbyn's advisors might advise him not to include that. Anyway, I, 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 but but the, I think secularism actually is important. I believe very powerfully that states should be secular. And where we see states not being secular, and we can see what the problems become. And so I, 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 I'm a firm believer that when it comes to politics, and it's not that I'm saying that people, that I, I'm a decrier of religion, what I'm saying is that, that our religion mustn't be the determinant of, mm -hmm. of how, how, how a nation is, is, is run. But I, 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 do, I do want to just get back to the business of, of it's true, people, people you know, are all, always want to reform things when they're disappointed with the results. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm not disappointed with the result of the referendum. <laughs> I'm deeply disappointed. Um, but, 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 but the impact of the, of, of the, the decision 
has huge ramifications that, that I think people didn't put their mind to. What's happening in Ireland now, the possible breakdown of the peace process in Ireland, the fact that this is, is, is feeding into um, problems for us in Scotland, um, uh, that, that, that part of this was to do with an English nationalism, the fact that, 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 that for many people in England, they feel a sense that they've been left out of the great discourse of our times. And so there is something wrong with when we keep having this reiteration of, you know, we've got to state what British values are to all these immigrants who come in, as if, as if the values are any different from the values that most people espouse, you know. I have alarm about some of that. So um, and, I, I and do think that constitutions were an attempt to kind of bind people without actually necessarily... Um, uh, you know, and in terms of the law and constitution here, is there anything major that you'd like to change? Well, I, you know, I'm a firm believer that incorporation of the European Convention of Human Rights mm. into uh, British law has been a vitally important development for us. It's changed the way that we lawyer. It's changed the ways that judges judge. And, and, and it's put the citizen really much more at the heart of, of, of law. And I think that's a terrific thing. And I, I want us all to remember that it was drawing on the, the, inter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a thing that came into being around the same time that India, India became independent. Part of all of that urgency at that time was decolon decolonization. And um, you know, people didn't come with clean hands to the, the Universal Declaration's Eleanor Roosevelt's tables. Yeah. They, they came with baggage. Britain came with baggage of what it had done on, in, as a colonizer in the world, as did many European countries. The, 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 the Soviets had the gulags in the background. You know, we had the whole business of what was happening in America, Jim Crow laws and racism, a horrible kind, still continuing, separate uh, uh, um, places of, to eat and to be schooled and so forth. So nobody came with clean hands, but it was aspirational. And I think we found something that is about speaking to the better parts of ourselves, and every nation needs that. Right, and, and just, just a footnote to that is, is that, of course, the, the Declaration of Human Rights and the wording of the Declaration of Human Rights to include women uh, was the result of an Indian lawmaker who was sitting in the Constituent Assembly who said, if you just say he, meaning the individual, to cover everybody, there might be some people in India who don't assume that that means the other 50% of the, the population. So that actually has an Indian... Indian root, if you like. So just one... Um, be proud, be <laughs> proud. <laughs> Indian women be proud, particularly. Just, just so one, one last thing before um, the, the discussion goes to the audience is, um, and I'm thinking of this really particularly in an Indian context, but it does apply here as well, is the real issue institutions and the strength of institutions, how they operate, whether they operate independently, rather than the constitution and... Uh, the, the way in which the law is, is, is the way in which constitutional law works. That's very interesting. Sure. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, those issues are almost very closely interlinked. Mm. Um, if you look at the way in which, and this is probably the largest, the biggest crisis we have currently in our constitution, uh, is the manner in which our most significant institutions are functioning. And if you take the example of the Supreme Court, the fact that it has a has a huge caseload, is yeah. essentially interfering in matters in which it lacks competence. Yeah. And on the other side, you have a parliament which is, of course, lost in some sense its legitimacy. Ordinances are the rule rather than the exception, yeah. um, and so on. But if there's, if there's one thing I would like to change about the Indian constitution, or the way in which we think about the Indian constitution, it's this. We should abandon this idea that the Supreme Court is the exclusive protector of the people's rights. Mm. Um, that's one of the real problems uh, in, in our current form of constitutional government. Um, the problem being, of course, that look, the courts have a certain competence. On the other hand, the courts don't deal well with several kinds of cases. They don't deal well with national security cases. They don't deal well with cases in which Striking down a law, for example, would have disruptive effects. Right. And we need to come closer to this ideal, which is, in a sense, actually a British ideal. It's an ideal that you see in Britain and Canada and New Zealand and Australia, that protecting rights is a joint collaborative effort amongst courts and parliament. And I think we do need to come back to that idea, rather than for parliament to assume that, well, we won't think about rights and we leave this project completely to the yes, courts. That's yeah. very interesting. So, I, I mean, I think you're quite right. I mean, there is a need for a greater de degree of conversation between the judicial process as well as the political process. But I think, you know, when you talk about the weakening of institutions, I think you're absolutely right in saying that a lot of institutions have really eroded. And 
how do we address that problem? And I think part of that is not to necessarily vest institutions with an absolute autonomy and hope that they will be the protector or they will be the defender. I think there is a need to equally address the issue of what is the larger political culture in the country. And this is something which gets very distorted. And why I'm a little squeamish about the generous overuse of the term populism and things like that is that, for example, in India, I'll give you a thing, what has happened is we've had a change of government. A change of government has also meant a change in a certain type of the political elite which has actually ruled for, 40, 50, for about 70 years. And that change of elite has resulted in a great deal of nervousness among certain entrenched groups. With the result, they use that as an excuse to say, oh, God, India is really going through a great crisis of legitimacy, democratic problems. There's been a truncation of the space for civil liberties. There's a truncation of everything. And what it actually means is that certain people who are in are out. And that's actually turned into, made into a great philosophical debate, which, to my mind, also affects <laughs> really the ability of us to actually strengthen institutions. And it's not that both sides don't do their own overreach. But that's really the problem, to my mind. That the value of, you know, Indians, or maybe the Hindus have never really valued the strength of institutions. We've never had. We've had ways of life, but we've never really created institutions. That's very interesting. I, I mean, I, I, what is very interesting is the way in which you're describing this as being a, a, an assault upon elites. And of course, that's what we're also talking about seeing here in Britain. Uh, um, the sort of challenge of the referendum was to say, um, we, we feel that you know, the people who have gov that governed us and taken us are granted and so on. That in some ways, has been a kind of a, a, a tapping into an alienation from, from political elites. But we've also seen that in the United States. I mean, certainly that's what the Trump has stood for. Um, and, uh, and, and it may be that that period after the end of the Second World War, I mean, what, 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 I mean it was part, you know, India got independence and, 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 and we saw, you know, the rise of anti-colonial, real anti-colonial movements and then it led to in the 50s the same sort of thing happening in Africa and other parts of the world. But also in Britain, what happened after the Second World War was that working class people, working class men um, and women said, you know, we've had enough of this. We, we fight your wars for you. Um, we, we do all that for you. Um, and we want a, better, a bigger cut of this cake than you've been giving us up until now. And so that's why the rhetoric of even socialism was in your constitution was because here the yeah. welfare state was created and across other parts of Europe. And indeed, you know, a new sort of deal uh, was, was possible in the United States too. That has all been turned on its head. And I think neoliberal economics has been a very pr important factor in all of this the world over. And we can't talk about the way in which our worlds are changing without recognizing the, f the forces that are operating in globalization, which are about a different way of econo economics working globally, and, and who se is served by that. And, and, and the sense that power is now somehow not even in national governments. And, uh, and that has, uh, has, uh, has created a great deal of unease. And I think that we're a long way from so solving all of this. There's a lot happening in our societies, but a lot of it is to do with the way in which we've seen the enrichment of some um, of, of, of small sections, not reaching down to, to, to many uh, um, others, and a feeling of, that somehow the earth is moving under our feet. And I mean, to an extent, we're seeing, we're seeing a rotation of elites, probably less so in India than in the United States, where you have a populist movement which is in effect captured by an elite that then suddenly finds itself in the White House and going on trips to Saudi Arabia. There's that speech coming up, I think, today from President Trump. Now, who in the audience would like to ask something? Yes, okay, so then let's take a, a range of um, questions and then we can sort of collectively answer them. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six people, please. So we'll, we'll, we'll go here first, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, uh. Talking about constitutions, what comes to mind uh, in particular is um, uh, bringing the East and the West together by um, looking at what the Americans say uh, and seeing how the Indians can take that on board. And that is to say, uh, in God we trust. Is that a possibility here as well? Thank you. Uh, and in the second row from the front. 
fantastic panel. Thank you. I'm Bhavna Rajpal, the director of the Sindhi Film Festival, and I'm doing my PhD on Sindhi cinema. Um, before I ask my question, I want to state a few facts. So just the panel before this, one of the founders of the Partition Museum said, oh, Sindhi is not even a national language. Please let, come let's, and let, let's stick to collaborate with us. Yeah. So I want to say that in 1967, it was accepted as part of the national language. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the f whole argument around yeah. Sindh to be removed from the National Anthem of India and the fact that Jhulalal Tiradham Trust is being constructed as the biggest Jhulalal temple in the world. I want to ask you all, what can the Sindhi community do in terms of collaborating with the government or the constitutional acceptance to increase the larger political culture of the community still feeling refugees and not Thank as you. nationals? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now, there's one question at the back there, yeah. Uh, thank you. So uh, it was a great discussion. Thanks for thanks for um, um, all your thoughts. I have a specific question. I think for Chintan, uh, and I think in general for everyone, but specifically, I think to, uh, directed towards you. What do you think in terms of how the constitutions across the world, all of all the democracies, especially the written constitutions, uh, are framed? What do you think is fundamentally l different and lacking in the Indian constitution? versus, say, the American constitution uh, in terms of structure. Uh, if you all kind of agree that written constitutions are better than non-written ones, what is it that's, that's something they're getting improved? Thank you. And we'll just add in one more question from here. Thank you. Uh, do you think the education system in the UK and also in India is equipping uh, young people and people generally with the skills they need for citizenship uh, in order to engage with uh, local government, national government, and international issues? Thanks. Okay, so we've got four questions there. Education, democracy and constitutions, the role of Sindh, and whether there are things that the East and West can learn about particularly trusting in God, Helena Kennedy. Um, I, I don't... I, you, you, there was a very famous thing that was said um, uh, by the um, right-hand man of Tony Blair at one stage. And, of course, Tony Blair was someone who made it very clear that he was a person of religion. Um, but, his, uh, but his advisor, Alistair Campbell. Uh, Alistair Campbell, said, we don't do God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and uh, and while I, and, and of course he is an atheist, but um, 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 I I I I got what he was saying. I mean, he was basically saying this should not be um, you know the, the the public espousal of one's religion um, uh, and 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 making it too much the centre of a, of a political program is not is not a useful thing, and and I happen to agree with that. Um, and I say that as somebody who, who ha has, you know, is, I was brought up as a Catholic and that's my background and so on. And I think it's informed who I am. But I don't, um, and so I would say no, I, I'm not with this thing about the America saying, you know, in God we trust. Um, I, 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 would sh I, sh I would step away from that. But I do want to just say on one or two other things. Um, on the Sindhi community thing, I can't speak about that. All I think is that minorities need to be protected inside any constitutions or in unwritten constitutions. And one of the things that the Human Rights Act in enabled was for people to say that they had to have their voice. Um, on written constitutions across the world, I actually think the one to look at, a fabulous constitution, is the South African constitution. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, uh, modern-day <coughs> constitution. But what it tells you all always is that constitutions um, you know, are in many ways you know, only as good as the life that you breathe into them and whether people will make them work. And, uh, and so we're also there seeing ways in which their constitution is under, under challenge. Um, on the education system, oh, I couldn't, uh, thank you for that question. Because I actually do think that we fail in the job that we have to, to have our, our young understand what politics is about, why it matters to vote, what, what the purpose of that is, how we create change by doing it, and that by not doing it, that you're allowing things to happen that, in your name um, that, that, that shouldn't happen, and that you're not entitled to complain if you aren't going out there and voting and taking part in the processes. But we, we, we fail to do that here in Britain, and I'm sure that you fail to do it adequately in India too, and I think that a much greater urgency goes around knowing our history, understanding who we are, and, and understanding how change is created. So, yes... We do, do need it. In and the do school. you feel that we as Catholics still face discrimination under the law? 
Well, I mean, you, we still can't. I mean, it's very interesting. My mother, I always remember saying, um, um, I said to her that Tony Blair went to mass with his, with his wife, and she said, don't tell the public that, don't tell anybody. They'll never want to vote for a Catholic to become the prime minister. And so, um, uh, uh, you know, there are still kind of rumblings under that. You've got to remember that in, uh, in, 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 you know, it's still part of our constitution. I mean, the, 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 we, we Prince, of, the, the Prince of Wales cannot, could not marry a Catholic. Um, you know, we still have those things written into law. And, uh, and I think you have to end all of that kind of stuff. I think it is terrible. Um, the only thing I would say is that it has disintegrated greatly. Even, even in Scotland? Well, in, in, even in Scotland, I think that the Scottish Nationalist Party, it's very interesting that my, my yeah. family would never have voted Scottish Nationalist because they saw it as being about uh, maintaining the, the, the authority of Protestantism and some, in some ways the Orange Lodge. And that was frightening to Catholics. Mm. But now that has changed. I think Alex Salmon reached out mm. to, uh, to make sure that Catholics were included in his cabinets and all that sort of thing. So I think it has diluted, but it's still there underneath the surface. And maybe these things take longer to get rid of. Uh, you know, uh, about in God we trust, you know. If you go to some of the Indian shops, you, you'll, you'll find a, 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 sort of a sort of a sticker put up. In God we trust, the rest strictly cash. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's always a bit, a bit of a problem as to where, where to introduce God into the whole yeah. uh, thing. And uh, it, it, it's not, I mean, as, as a sort of personal philosophy, I always steer very clear of theological discussions. Me too. You know, for every text someone quotes, uh, if you quote some text, Someone can quote something back. It's a bit like you know quoting Lenin in the old days. You know, mm. everyone could give you one quote of Lenin, which was equally. So it's it's, it's best to take God away. I mean, keep it to the uh, uh, witness stands, and hope for the best there. Uh, uh, the question of sin. That I, I, I don't think you know. I mean, I, I think in the it's it's very very mindful. In the Sindhi is recognised as a. National language in India. I thought you said the question of sin. Sin. No, 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 no. This is the old, old Napier thing about Pekavi. There's a sin. There's a language is there. You know, the it's it's part of the national anthem. Although a lot of people think it's of an oddity. It doesn't matter. You know, the point is that Sindhis are very pro the Sindhi Hindus are a very prosperous community in India. They're extremely prosperous. Uh, they're extremely prosperous. I've rarely come across a non-prosperous Sindhi in India. <laughs> they're some of the best retailers in India. They control and they Oh, well, I think it's a hypothetical issue. Uh, but, uh, but but it's a very, you know, it's a very robust and well-organized community. No, 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 it's not a question. No, I don't think the, it, there is any allegation to date that the human rights of Sindhis in India have been violated. I cannot say the same for a neighboring country. But, but as far as India is concerned, it's, it's, it's there. But to get back to this larger question of minority rights, and I think this was really at, at the heart of this. And I think the, here there is a problem. And I think that this is a genuine confusion in the minds of a lot of people. While in principle, the rights of minorities to be protected is, I think, we all agree on that. Mm. In India, we have a unique problem where in protecting the rights of minorities, you create a sense of grievance among those who loosely c c call themselves a majority. This we found in the Right to, Info uh, right to Education Act, whereby a minority school, which means uh, schools run by <laughs> Parsis or Muslims or Christians are exempt from the RTE Act, whereas any other school is automatically come under government legislation. They say, well, you know, you know, why can't we have denominational schools? Mm -hmm. That question comes in. So, no, can, can, can I just ask? I mean, you know, g given the, the the economic disadvantage of Indian Muslims as a whole, is that majority sense of grievance really? based on anything more than a, a kind of inaccurate supposition about who has the privilege. India's got a very bitter experience with what constitutes religious, uh, you know, reservation. The entire 47 issue, the partition of India, is still very much something. So the idea that there should be any special, while there is protection, 
Well, there should be extraordinary political rights granted on the basis of religion mm. is something which, by and large, we've sort of did it, decided is, is a no-no. So while civil rights, other forms of rights are granted, educational rights, mm. there is now a robust deb debate on what whether personal laws of Muslims should necessarily correspond to the larger interpretation of what you call gender rights or human rights. No, no, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, a that, that's a very interesting because... That, that, that is a reasonable argument. What I'm saying about the sense of majoritarian grievance, is it really justified? Well, if people feel in a certain way... No, I mean, but then you could make the same argument... Of course, uh, I, 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 I mean, which is why I'm very sympathetic to why the people here voted for Brexit. Oh, okay. Uh, we, we've just got time for one last question, and then I'm going to... Yeah, from you here, yeah, please. Um, and then I'm going to ask um, yeah. Chinton to say his closing point. We've got another... Yeah, we've just got two minutes. Yeah. Oh, actually, okay, you both, both, both ask very brief questions, please. Thank you. Um, hello. I wanted to ask something that might be a little bit provocative, but... Um, oh. <laughs> About time. A little bit, a little bit. Um, so the Brexit vote was largely a vote made by people over 60, if my... So my question is, I do believe in democracy, and I don't believe that referendums are necessarily a bad option, okay. but people with an average life expectancy of 25 years are taking decisions right. for people with an average life expectancy of 60, 65 years. And your question is, should that be should, a fair basis? Should there be sort of a weighing system? Should each vote Down really the generations. be... Okay. Yeah, exactly. Weighting your votes. That's like uh, Oxbridge oh. graduates being given two votes. <laughs> as happened up until not that long ago. Uh, one very quick question from you. Thank you. Um, this is more of a comment rather than a question. And uh, one thing is, um, the first one is, is for Patrick. Oh. Uh, in terms of the general majority oh. grievance, trust me, it's very real because the concept of minority, mm -hmm. it can change even within India, based on where you are, within regions. Mm -hmm. And you can be treated as a mi minority in a different place. Right. So uh, being a Bengali, mm -hmm. but I was born and brought up in uh, Tura, which is in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And they've got a tribal uh, majority. Mm -hmm. So I am ab an absolute minority, absolute outcast, and yet deprived of everything else, both in the general section and in the minority. And I speak for everyone when I say I. Uh. Okay. So I mean, that's. A, a bit of an insight yeah. into that. Yeah. So it, it's again dependent on the situation and the circumstance you would put through. And what was your second point? Um, both of them. Okay, covered. Fine. Yeah. So Chintan, I'll just give you the chance um, to come so back. So there was, there was an interesting question raised earlier which I'd like to take up, which is what sets India apart? I mean, what sets our constitution apart from, you said, the United States Constitution? Um, or any of the other constitutions that were enacted after the First World, after the Second World War. Um, I mean, there is a school of thought, um, and this, this has tended to trouble constitutional theorists for a while, that a constitution depends for its success upon the success of a nation. And so, for, for example, several people have actually argued that to determine the success of a constitution, you simply need to look at the GDP figures of a state. And that does hold true to some extent in, in many of the post-war constitutions, mm. such as France, Italy, Germany, Poland, and so on. Uh, I think India is actually a good example, a good aberration um, against that trend. Because even though the economy was in the doldrums until the early 90s, I think even in 1991, it would be fair to describe the Indian experiment as perhaps the, the most successful constitutional experiment in human history. Uh, so I think that demonstrates that it's something beyond merely economic success yes. that makes this constitution makes, succeed. Right. Uh, I think uh, we're going to have to close there. Can I just there, make but, one but, small, yeah. very, very, very small point? Yeah. Very, uh, it's a very, very interesting point which you made. And, and, but I mean, I'm always intrigued that the young people who in 1975, or was it 76, voted in favor of joining the EU, when they became old, <laughs> Vote it against. <laughs> well, thank you for the, to, to all the panelists. Thank you to you, the people. <laughs>